Shalom Talmudim and welcome to the 10th and final lecture in this series looking at faith from a Messiah following Jewish perspective. So we've covered first of all an introduction to Messianic Jewish or Biblical Hebrew thought and then we've progressed our way through uh, the festival observances of the Bible and we're now coming to the last of those observances some call this Hanukkah celebration an extra biblical holiday uh, because it's not commanded directly by God in the Torah. However, it is included in the full Bible, the Tanakh and the Brit Chadesha. It's included in the New Testament in the book of John in chapter 10, the latter part of chapter 10 of the Gospel according to John. It is a festival that Yeshua or Jesus did celebrate and a festival that he clearly venerated based on the fact that he used this festival and its themes to declare himself as the shepherd of Israel and to give yet another confirmation of his identity as the King Messiah promise to the people of Israel. So Hanukkah, it means dedication, and I've titled the slides Rededication because in fact Hanukkah, when it was celebrated, was seen as a type of rededication of the temple, the temple having been dedicated certainly originally by Melech Shlomo, the King Solomon, David's son. So this festival was seen as a rededication because it results after the priests who became warriors, the Maccabees, retook the temple from an evil ruler. Hanukkah reminds us of the victory of the Maccabees, which took place in 165 BCE. The Maccabees were a group of priests and they became warriors in order to take back the temple mount, the temple itself, and to cleanse it for reuse as a temple of God. They needed to cleanse it because Antiochus Epiphanes, the Syrophoenician ruler, whose name quite literally means the manifest God, his armies had taken over Israel, and he had defiled the temple and the altar with pig's blood, and had set up an idol in the Holy of Holies, that is, in the place where the Ark of the Covenant once had its home. So he set up an idol which utterly desecrated the holiness of the temple in Jerusalem. It's interesting to note that the prophet Daniel, hundreds of years beforehand, prophesied the defiling of the temple and the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes. Daniel also sees Antiochus as a figure for a yet future anti-Messiah who will rise up in the world to bring people's focus on idolatry and to refuse the deity of Hashem and instead place himself in the position of deity. At this time there will be great trouble for Israel, that is the children of Jacob and their descendants, the Jewish people, and this time is known in the scriptures as the time of Jacob's trouble. You can read about this in Jeremiah 30, 4-7, and in Zechariah 13, 8-9. At this yet future time, the Messiah Yeshua, as the great shepherd leader, will come and win a tremendous victory, greater than that won by Yehuda the Maccabee. He will save Israel and establish worldwide rule. We read about this in Zechariah 12, 14, and it is illuminated and affirmed in 1 Peter 5, 4. So you see, this festival has a lot to do with faith in Yeshua, with faith in Jesus. One of the prayers from our Siddur, or prayer book, which we use at this time during Hanukkah, goes like this. In the days of the Hasmonean, Matitiyahu ben Yohanan, the great priest, and his sons, when a wicked Hellenistic government rose up against Israel, your people, to make them forget your Torah and to break the laws you gave, 
You with great mercy stood by them in the time of their distress. You championed their cause, defended their rights and avenged their wrong. You delivered the strong into the hands of the weak, the many into the hands of the few, the impure into the hands of the pure, the ungodly into the hands of the godly, and the arrogant into the hands of the students of the Torah. You made a great and holy name for yourself in the world and for your people Israel. You performed a great deliverance, whereupon your children entered your sanctuary, cleansed the temple, purified your house, kindled lights in your holy courts, and instituted these eight days of Hanukkah for thanksgiving and praise to your great name. It's interesting to note that like the festival of Passover, Pesach, and the festival of Purim, the festival that remembers Esther's story, Hanukkah is a festival of God's redeeming his people from bondage, from oppression, and delivering them so that they might worship him, the one true God of Israel, the God of all creation. The apocryphal books of the Maccabees record some history and some mythos, but the history of the books of the Maccabees is verified by other sources of the time, including Josephus, the famous Jewish historian. It's worthwhile reading through a telling of the story of Hanukkah so that you have some foundation for understanding how Yeshua, how Jesus, venerated and utilized this story to proclaim his own identity as shepherd of Israel and as the King Messiah. This happens in John chapter 10 from verses 21 onward, and we're going to look at that in a moment. But firstly, I'd like to read you a narration of the story of Hanukkah from the Jewish Siddur, taken from a book called Hila, Stories for Hanukkah. Now it happened that in the 23rd year of his reign, that's 168 BCE, which was 213 years after the rebuilding of the temple by Ezra the scribe, that King Antiochus said to his generals, Abolish the Torah and all the academies where it is taught from the land of the Jews. Kill all those who observe the Jewish customs. They no longer may circumcise their male infants, and they may not observe their dietary laws. Compel them to violate the Sabbath and bow down before our gods and bring their sacrifices to them on our altars and send my servants throughout the land to see that this be done. And the generals did as Antiochus told them. They went throughout the entire land of Israel and they pulled down the synagogues and the houses of study. They defiled and destroyed the Torah scrolls and killed all who complained. There were many martyrs who died to uphold God's name, and their blood was on the head of Antiochus. Not long after that, the heathen priests of Antiochus consecrated the temple in Jerusalem to their chief god, Zeus. And they raised a great statue of him upon the altar in the sanctuary. In his honor, they sacrificed a pig upon the altar and sprinkled its unclean blood in the sanctuary. Now it so happened that Apelles, a Greek official, came to the village of Modin, which is not far from Jerusalem, to carry out the decree of Antiochus. He raised an altar to the Greek gods and commanded the Jews to sacrifice a pig on it. Among those who gathered was Matisiahu, an old priest of the Hasmonean clan, and his five sons, Yohanan, Shimon, Yehuda, Eliezer, and Yonatan. When Matisiahu heard about the abomination Apalis wished the Jews to perform, he said to them, O oh, my brothers, let all the nations of the provinces that are subject to King Antiochus obey him if they choose, even to the extent of betraying the religion of their forefathers. But we swear we shall not leave the path of our religion to go either to the right 
or to the left. With these words, he killed Apelles. Then Matisiahu cried out to the Jews, Take up arms. Whoever is for God and his holy law, let him follow me. And many followed him. Shortly afterward, Matisiahu died, and Yehuda took his place as leader. He was so invincible in battle that the Yehudim, the Jews, called him Maccabee, which in Aramaic means hammer, for he struck at the Greeks like a hammer, blow after blow. When King Antiochus heard of this, he grew very angry and sent army after army to punish the Jews, but Judah swooped down on them unexpectedly from the hills and crushed them all. So Antiochus sent his most cunning generals and over 50,000 men. When the Yehudim, the Jews, saw how the enemy vastly outnumbered their own forces, they were struck with fear. Seeing this, Yehuda, Judah, said to them, Terrible indeed is the might of the Greeks, but more terrible is the vengeance of the Lord when he strikes at the wicked. Do not fear the enemy, even though they are many and we are but few. Know that God is with us, even though we are weak and our righteous cause will triumph over their greater numbers. Therefore, take heart and be courageous. And so was his custom before battle. Yehuda, Judah, fasted and prayed. He also confessed his sins and his men did as he did. Then they were no longer afraid. And when the moment came to strike, Yehuda, Judah, commanded the trumpeteers to sound the call to battle. Judah and his men then attacked the enemy who ran in confusion and terror, and they killed many of those that resisted them. After the enemy retreated, Judah assembled the people in Jerusalem and said to them, Let us go up to the house of God and purify it, for it has been wickedly profaned. And after they had carefully purified the temple and threw out all the idols and their altars, they brought in new vessels, the seven-branched golden menorah, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. They also pulled down the altar of burnt offerings which had been profaned and built a new one in its place. And so on the 25th day of the month of Kislev, Yehuda, Judah, rededicated the temple. He lit the lamps of the menorah and offered incense and burnt offerings on the altar. However, when they wished to light the lamps, they looked for pure olive oil, but they found none except one small vessel. The vessel contained oil sufficient for use for only one day. Yet a miracle happened. The oil burned for eight days until new holy oil could be prepared. And in commemoration of the rededication of the temple, Judah decreed that on the 25th day of Kislev of each year, the Jews were to celebrate the festival of lights, the festival of dedication, Hanukkah, for eight days. They were to burn lights during this period, adding a new light each night and singing songs of praise, Hallel, to celebrate the triumph of Israel in the struggle for its freedom. Also told in the Hila, the stories of Hanukkah, is this story of Hannah and her seven sons. And it reads powerfully and really touches the heart. The faith of these people was profound. Let me read you that story before we go on to my explanation of Hanukkah and how it relates to Yeshua and to you and I as disciples of Jesus. Hannah and her seven sons. Hannah, the daughter of Tanum, and her seven sons were taken captive and brought before the king in Rome. To the first son, the king said, bow down before the idol. I will not deny the Holy One, praised be he, replied the boy, for he has told us, I am the Lord your God. Kill him, commanded the king. And they did as he commanded. Then they led in the second son. 
Bow down before the idol, ordered the king. I will not betray my God, cried the boy, for he has written, You shall have no other gods before me. Him too, the king ordered slain. Next came the turn of the third son. Bow down before the idol, ordered the king. The boy answered, I will not bow down before the idol, because God has commanded, You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. And they led him out to die like his brothers. The same happened with the fourth son. He said, I will not be faithless to my God who has commanded, for you shall bow down to no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. And him too they led away to die. When the fifth son came before the king, he cried out, Shall I abandon my God who has exhorted us, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone? He too had to die. Afterwards they brought the sixth son of Hannah, and the king spoke to him as he had to his five brothers. He answered, I will not turn away from my God, because in his Torah it is written, And you shall find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. Kill him, cried the king. Finally they brought the seventh and youngest son of Hannah. Bow down before the idol, ordered the king. I will first ask counsel of my mother, the boy answered. Then he went to his mother and said, What shall I do, mother? And Hannah replied, Do you wish to stand without while your brothers rest in the radiance of the Almighty? Heed me then. Don't listen to this wicked man and remain true to your dear brothers. And so the boy returned to the king and the king asked, Will you obey me now? I will not deny my God, cried the boy, for it is written, The Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not fail you, neither destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers, which he swore unto them. Hear my words, commanded the king. You are only a child and don't know what you are doing. Do as I tell you and I will spare your life. I will throw my ring, on which is engraved the image of my idol, on the floor, Bend down and pick it up so that everyone will think that you have bowed down before my God. If I am not afraid to face my maker, the ruler of the universe, how much less should I fear you, who are only a man? Then die, cried the king. And when Hannah saw how they came to put her youngest to death, she was filled with a terrible grief. Let me kiss him first, she pleaded. The king granted her wish, and she drew the boy into her arms and kissed and caressed him. I swear by your life, O king, she implored. Slay me first before you slay my child. That I cannot do, answered the king, for your Torah forbids the killing of a mother with her young. Hypocrite, cried Hannah in anger. Have you followed all the precepts of the Torah? that only this precept is left for you to observe? And the king was enraged and cried out, Let the child be killed instantly. But Hannah would not let go of her boy. Don't be sad or afraid, she told him. You are now going to paradise to join your brothers who have died before you. And when you see your father Avraham, tell him, Thus spoke my mother, you, Avraham, must not be proud because you built an altar on which to sacrifice your son, Yitzchak, to the Lord. I raised seven altars for my seven sons. You, Avraham, only wish to bring your son as a sacrifice. I sacrificed all my sons. You were only tested. I was bereaved. And as Hannah spoke to her youngest, they killed him. In her arms. She then raised her hands to heaven and prayed, My heart rejoices in the Eternal, because my children remained faithful to him in death as in life. You enemies and oppressors of Israel, now in vain is your arrogance. Know that if God punishes us now, it is not because you are mighty, but because it is his will. O Lord, I implore you, Take my life from me, so that I may be united with my dear children. Do not abandon me to the scorn and derision of our enemies, but take me to you. And no sooner had she ended her prayer than she sank to the earth 
and died. This is just one of the many stories associated with Hanukkah and with the faithful commitment of the Jewish people to the one true God, the God of Israel, El, Elohei Israel. These stories challenge us in our faith and our commitment to God. And they also give us an understanding of the foundation and the pretext to John chapter 10 verses 21 onwards, where Yeshua is in Jerusalem, walking in Solomon's colonnade in the outer court of the temple. And it is here that he speaks to those who are gathered around him, those who are expectant of a Messiah, but have not yet concluded that he is that King Messiah. So now it's our privilege to take a look at the Feast of Rededication, the Feast of Hanukkah. We're going to do this by reading about Yeshua's veneration of Hanukkah, and we can find that in Yohanan, or the Gospel according to John, chapter 10, and I'm going to read from verse 22 onward. Then came Hanukkah. It was winter in Yerushalayim. Yeshua was walking in the temple around Solomon's colonnade. Then the Judean leaders surrounded him, saying, How long will you hold us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us outright. Yeshua answered them, I told you, but you don't believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify concerning me, but you don't believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are echad, a complex unity. Again, the Judean religious leaders picked up stones to stone him. Yeshua answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these are you going to stone me? The Judean leaders answered, We aren't stoning you for a good work, but for blasphemy. Though you are man, you make yourself God. Yeshua answered them, Isn't it written in your writings? I have said you are gods, rulers, judges. If he called them gods, rulers, judges, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him, the one the Father set apart and sent into the world, you speak blasphemy, because I said, I am Ben Elohim, son of God. If I don't do the works of my Father, don't believe me. But if I do, even if you don't trust me, trust the deeds. Then you may come to know and continue to understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Therefore, they tried to capture him again, but he escaped from their hand. Again, He went back across the Jordan to the place where John first started immersing, and he stayed there. Many people came to him and were saying, John performed no sign, but all John said about this man was true. So let's take a fresh look at the story of Hanukkah, this historical festival being venerated by Yeshua, recorded in John's Gospel. The year was 165 BC. It was a dark time in Israel's history. Israel was being oppressed by an evil world ruler, Antiochus Epiphanes, whose name translates the visible image of God. He had banned all practices associated with the worship of the God of Israel. Many Jews had given up their faith in God, and the temple in Jerusalem had been darkened by idolatry. However, a small group of Jews remained faithful to God and refused to bow down to Antiochus and his false gods 
And this group of Jews was led by a family of priests, a family of priests who became warriors. And a small army of warrior priests led by Judah Maccabee approached the court of Israel, which was inside the temple complex in Jerusalem. As they walked past the altar of sacrifice toward the doorway of the temple, they saw the remnants of burnt pig skin and smelt the foul stench of pig's blood. The temple was dark, devoid of light, and as they entered in, the men tripped on debris and slid on pig fat and feces. An idol of the Greek god Zeus stood in the Holy of Holies and the remnants of the pig parts and fowl littered the floor. The seven-branched menorah, the windowless temple's primary source of light, lay toppled on the stone floor. One of the Maccabean warriors called out in the darkness, I found a vial of undefiled oil. The priestly seal is still on it. I discovered it hidden beneath the floor in one of the side rooms. Yehuda, that is Judah, instructed his men to begin to cleanse the temple. He collected the vial of oil and used it to light the menorah, believing there was enough oil to keep the menorah lit for only one day. Miraculously, it continued to burn for eight days, which was enough time to produce and consecrate new oil to sustain the light. The light being a figure and a representation of God's light presence, present to illuminate the darkness of our lives. On the eighth day, as Yehuda, Judah, returned to his residence, he walked through the section of the temple complex known as Solomon's Colonnade. Some of the Judean religious leaders asked him, What shall we do with the defiled altar stones? They can't be used again because we are unable to purge them of the pig's blood. Judah answered, When Messiah comes, he will tell us what to do with the desecrated stones. Some 200 years later, in approximately 30 CE, 30 AD, it was winter, the time of the festival of Hanukkah, which was being celebrated in Jerusalem in memory of the Maccabean revolt and the rededication of the temple. Yeshua was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. Some of the Judean religious leaders who were there gathered around him and asked, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us publicly. I have a picture here of Yeshua and those religious leaders. Look at it carefully. Yeshua answered them, I have already told you. And you don't trust me. Note that in this picture, Yeshua is dressed like the religious leaders. Why? Because for all intents and purposes, Yeshua, like the religious leaders, was a perush, a chaste one, a Pharisee. He held in common with the perushim, the pharisaical sect all of their primary theological doctrines, a belief in the entire Tanakh, the Torah, the prophets and the writings, a belief in the resurrection of the dead, a belief in angels and demons, a belief in miracles, and the practical outworking of all those things. Please look at the picture again. Many of us, when we think of Yeshua, Picture the pale-faced, blue-eyed, blonde-haired Jesus of stained-glass windows and churches. He is not. He is the Jew, Yeshua, a Middle Eastern man, 
By prophesying his own sacrificial death and resurrection, Yeshua answered the question of what should be done with the defiled altar stones. Essentially, he was saying, throw them away. You don't need them anymore. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. In Messiah Yeshua, each of us has become a temple of the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 6.19 reads this way, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. In Messiah Yeshua, we, the community of faith, have become the temple of God's Spirit. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 In Messiah Yeshua, we the community of faith are symbolized by the menorah, which is a symbol of the light presence of God, the Shekhinah, or the Kavod Hashem. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden menorot, the seven stars are the angels of the seven faith communities. And the seven menorot are the seven faith communities. Yeshua challenges us with these words. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? With these words, we are reminded to examine our own lives, being that the scripture teaches that we individually are a temple of the Holy Spirit and that we corporately, as ecclesia, as gathered believers, are a temple of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Remember how the temple was defiled by Antiochus Epiphanes. Remember how he darkened the temple. Remember how he set up an idol in the holiest place. Have we allowed the temple of our lives to be darkened? Have we gone after idols and allowed an idol to be set up in the depths of our being? Our being, where the Messiah's spirit dwells? We are challenged to make sure that the light that is within us is the light of the King Messiah, the menorah that shows the light of his present glory in us. We are challenged to do what the Maccabees did, to come and to cleanse the temple of debris, of filth, of idolatry. But we're not able to do this on our own. We need the oil of God's Ruach HaKodesh, His Holy Spirit. Not temporary oil that lights our menorah only for eight days, but oil that continues to burn, le'olam vayed, perpetually, and eternally. And none of this is possible without the King Messiah Yeshua, Jesus, his blood sacrifice, his vicarious atonement, his substitutionary work on our behalf, so that through his shed blood and his resurrection, we might receive the promised Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and allow God to cleanse every room of the temple that we have become, so that together we might be a pure, set-apart, holy people 
called of God. And the scripture tells us why we've been called as a holy people. It is so that we might give an account of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. What a privilege to be able to rededicate ourselves today to celebrate Hanukkah in a very practical spiritual way and say, Father God, search me and know my heart. See if there is any wrong way in me that I might walk in your path, which is everlasting. Today afresh, let's take the opportunity afforded us by the celebration of Hanukkah to rededicate our lives to God both individually and corporately. Let's ask Yeshua to purge us of any darkness in us and illuminate our inner being with the light of his spirit. For by one offering he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. I have here a visual cue to just connect for you the roles of priesthood and warrior. We often think of priests as being pacifists, but this is not how the Bible always portrays the priesthood, nor are the prophets of the Bible always pacifists. We know, for example, that the prophet Shemuel, Samuel, took a sword and killed the king Agag of the Amalekites. We're reminded that there is an intrinsic connection between priesthood and the battle that is fought against evil. We are warriors not of our own strength, but of the strength of the Spirit of God afforded us through the blood of Yeshua and his resurrection life. I'd like to take you through some of the prayers associated with Hanukkah as we finish today. The first prayer is the one for the lighting of the Chanukiyah, that is the special menorah that we use for Hanukkah. Unlike the menorah from the temple, it has eight main candles and one central candle called the Shamash, or servant. In the servant candle, we see Yeshua, the servant king Messiah, represented, who said, I have not come to be served, but to serve. We take the light of this candle, and each night we light one of the candles of the Hanukkiah. Depending on your tradition, they are lit from left to right or right to left. In our family, we see each light to be a symbol of someone who has yet to come to faith in Yeshua. And so we see the symbol of the Shamash, the servant, being carried toward that person, and we ask that God might bring them to salvation as we pray and light each candle. This also reminds us that it is God who reveals himself to us and we who receive him and not the other way around. Let me say the blessing. Ba'och Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kedishanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu, Lehad leg near shel Chanukah. All blessing comes from you, O Lord our God, King of the entire universe, who sanctifies us by your right actions and commands us to kindle the flame of Chanukah, the flame of dedication. Next comes the blessing that reminds us of the miracles that God has performed for us in order to deliver us in days of old. Ba'och ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, sha'asa nisim l'avotenu b'yamin ha'chim b'zman ha'zeh. All blessing comes from you, O Lord our God, King of the entire universe, who has performed miracles for our ancestors in those days at this season. Finally, the blessing for the first night of Hanukkah, and in fact, it's a blessing we pray at many of our festivals, and I believe I've sung it to you already. Here I'm going to sing it again, and then offer you an opportunity to sing with me. 
ברוך אתה אדוני, אלוהינו מלך העולם, שהחיינו וקיימנו והגיענו לזמן הזה. All blessing comes from you, Lord our God, King of the entire universe, who has given us life and has sustained us and enabled us to reach this season together. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Shehechianu, Vekiyimanu, Vehigiyanu, Lazman We kindle these lights for the miracles and workers of salvation and battles that you performed for our ancestors in those days at this season through your holy Kohanim, priests. All eight days of Hanukkah, these lights are sacred. We light them as a reminder of your miracles and wonders and salvation and as a reminder of our need to give thanks and praise to your great name. Finally, I'd like to share with you a very famous hymn chanted or sung during Hanukkah celebrations called Maoz Tzor, a mighty stronghold or a strong rock is our God. This is how the song goes. Again, I'll sing it once through and then give you an opportunity to sing with me as we finish up this final lecture in this series looking at faith from a Messiah-following Jewish perspective. Maoz Tzor Maoz Tzor Yeshuati Lechanae Leshabeach Tikon Beit Tefilati Vesham toda nezabeach Leitachin matbeach Mitzacha minabeach Azigmo bishir mismo Chanukat hamizbeach אז יגמו בשיר מזמור חנוכת המזבח. O mighty stronghold of my salvation, to praise you is a delight. Restore my house of prayer, and there we will bring a rededication offering. Let's sing together to close this final lecture. Mao so Yeshua ti lechana e lechabeach ti kon beit tefilati vesham toda nizabeach Leitachin mat beyach Mitzar hamina beyach Azigmo bishir mizmor Chanukat hamizbeyach Azigmo bishir mizmor Chanukat Hamizbeach. And we finish with the Hebrew word for altar, Mizbeach, from the Hebrew word for slaughter. And we are reminded that without the shedding of the Messiah's blood, there is no remission for sin. Praise God, who sent his Son our King Messiah Yeshua, so that you and I could be reconciled to him in perfect relationship. Shalom Lechem. Thanks so much for joining me on this journey.